Hi, I'm David Souter. We are going to look at a demo today by the uh, wonderful guys at TensorFlow. Uh, it's called playground.tensorflow.org. Uh, the purpose of this is so you can see with a very simple network uh, some of the ideas that we've introduced to you about network structure and uh, uh, number of features and so on in the training. So let's do a quick tour of what uh, the demo looks like. Across the top here we have some uh, items to do with the training of the network. Um, for this first section we're not going to be so interested in these uh, values here. Let's look down the left hand side and down the left hand side it's to do with the data that's being classified. And we're using the default which is this uh, concentric circle of, uh, of data points of two classes, blue and orange. Um, underneath that we have a slider bar where we can select how much of the data to use for training and how much of the data to use for testing. And of course you shouldn't use all of your data uh, for training because the test data has to be independent. The test data has to be unseen by the uh, network as it's training. Um, there's another slider bar to do with adding noise to the data. You'll see that later. And then there's a, a slider bar that I would normally associate with the top. It's to do largely with the training, but uh, the, the guys have put it down there on the, on the left-hand side called bat size. We'll come back to that again later. Then we've got the network in the middle. And the network is coming up in this uh, default configuration with two input units, four hidden units, and two output units. And it's not that surprising that that's kind of the default uh, structure for the network because we know that a network with one hidden layer, which this has, is basically capable of doing any classification that you like. On the right hand side we have the output of the network. Now this network currently has random weights and so it's producing some output. And um, the whole of the output region here, which is this square, is color coded as to what the network thinks dots or data points in that region of the uh, output space ought to be classified as. So at the moment it doesn't make a terrible lot of sense and we can see that we've got here that the test loss and the training loss, which is basically the errors made by the uh, network on the test data and the training data, is roughly 50%, which is what you'd expect from random um, effects of uh, setting up the weights to random values, random choice, flipping a coin, about 50%. So we're actually going to simplify this network first because we want to illustrate a point that uh, we made first off in the lectures about uh, perceptrons. So I'm going to remove one hidden layer. So I click on that button there to remove the hidden layer. And I'm also, because we've only got in our output uh, one class, I'm going to reduce this to just one output neuron. Uh, that's all we need. If the neuron is uh, turned off, it'll be one class. If it's turned maximally on, it'll be the other class. Okay, so let's uh, start the ne network here training. Um, and watch very closely. There'll be a graph appears on this part of the screen uh, with two traces. One is showing basically the uh, loss, which is the uh, measure of how good it's doing. Uh, we want to, to get the loss low. It's an inverse uh, um, scale uh, on the training and on the test uh, data. And also watch how the in this region here the uh, classification boundaries evolve. So we'll start at training. Okay, and you can see two graph um, traces here on the right. Uh, the upper one here is the uh, loss on the uh, test data which is unseen during the training and the lower one here is the loss on the training data and of course the network's seeing that and is able to reduce that um, trace more than it can reduce this trace here. And the gap here is basically the, ge the generalization gap. How well can the network do on unseen data? Ideally we'd like that gap to be basically zero if it's generalizing perfectly. Now on the uh, top left hand corner here We've got uh, a um, counter which went from zero and it's now up to 258. And this counter here is called epochs, which is basically complete passes through all the training centers, uh, training samples. That's one epoch, a complete pass through the whole training set. On the, back on the lower right hand corner here, we can see that the decision boundary is as we'd expect. We know that the perceptron 
um, is basically like logistic regression and it has a linear decision boundary. And because the data is not linearly separable, um, it's not doing terribly well on the uh, classification of this data. Um, it's doing a little bit better than the 50% that it started out with. Um, that's because the data is not perfectly balanced and it can find a line which um, you know, uh, classifies slightly better than 50%. Um, but it's not going to do much better than that. It simply can't. So, how can we fix the problem that uh, the perceptron, the single neuron, is basically incapable of classifying um, data that's not linearly separable? Well, there's essentially two ways around it. The first way around it is to basically add features. So we can click on here to add other features. And you can see that these other features here, the first one is the square of the first coordinate. The second one is the square of the second coordinate. So these are nonlinear features. These are features that have been pre-calculated and now fed into the network. And we've got here the product of the features and the, um, and the sign of the, uh, of the first data value, uh, the first coordinate value. So let's now try and train this network. It's now got extra features. It's, we've enriched the feature space. And we can see very, very quickly here that it's managed to classify pretty well perfectly uh, the data. OK, we've just seen that with a single perceptron, you can basically enrich the data space um, to still classify the data. Um, but of course, that's not a very general solution. How many features do you have to generate? Where do you get these features from, etc.? The network structure is the other way to get over this uh, problem of the limits of linear separability. Uh, we learnt in lectures that a single layer neuron a single layer network is capable of classifying basically any data. It's the most powerful structure uh, of any structure in that sense. Um, so we're returning now to uh, having our hidden layer with four neurons in this particular default setting. For the output layer, we only need uh, one neuron instead of two, so I'll remove one of those. We've only got two classes. Um, and. Uh, We've removed all those extra features that uh, we had previously uh, in the demonstration. So we've only got the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate, the first coordinate, the second coordinate of the uh, data points as our input uh, data. Now this is not linearly separable, but we have a network with one hidden layer. Let's see the network in progress as it trains. You can see very, very rapidly it develops a nonlinear boundary. Here it is on the uh, plot on the right. And it almost perfectly classifies, or in this case, it, it, it perfectly classifies because there's a big gap between the data, the data into the two classes. OK, we've just seen two things. The first thing is that a perceptron is not capable of classifying data that's not linearly separable. And one way out of this is to add features, nonlinear features, to essentially increase the dimension of the data space. And that allows the data now become linearly separable. The other way is to include a hidden layer. That's what we just saw just then. But with the training process, we kept the training parameters exactly as they were in the defaults. And that's not usually going to work for you in more complex situations. So in the next part, you're going to see what are some of the training parameters that you can adjust and what sort of effects they might have on the training process. See you soon.